Thanks, Jeff. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you guys for being here this morning. You are here for financial planning for renters. If that's not why you're here, then, uh, you know, you're here for the free food. But we're going to get started right now. Uh, all those folks that you've seen over here set up on the sides, these are just a few of your affiliates, but these are your sponsors for today's event. They bring you events like this event, the first Wednesday event. They bring you amazing networking events. So I'm just going to have them come up here and uh, introduce themselves and their companies, and we want to thank them for making this event and more events like this possible. So go ahead and come on up and introduce yourselves, please. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am Antoinette Baca. I am the chair of the affiliate committee this year, and I am also an owner agent with Farmers Insurance. I'll use a mic. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Pete with Servant360. We do photos, floor plans, virtual tours, and video. Good morning. Monica Lopez, America's Preferred Home Warranty, the home warranty company that allows the homeowner to choose their own licensed contractor for all cover repairs. Thank you for having us. Good morning. My name is Mark Travis. I'm with Waterstone Mortgage. Uh, pleasure being here. I hope you guys have a great class. Good morning, guys. I'm Teresa Carter with Water Extraction Experts. We are your local heroes in water damage restoration and mold remediation. Good morning. Lloyd with Ma Auction Addiction Estate Sales, your only GAR affiliate member that does estate sales, moving sales, downsizing sales, senior moving sales, business liquidations. You name it, we sell everything but the home, and that's your job. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my Steve Checo, I'm with Directors Mortgage here in Albuquerque, full service lender. Welcome and enjoy the class. A hand for our affiliate sponsors. Thank you guys. Well, the time is 10 o'clock right now, so we're going to be very prompt, but I want to be sure to announce one more time to get your one free CE for this class. Please be sure that you have signed in with the folks out front. If you need to jump up and run out and do that really quick, please do. And then at the end of the class, please be sure to stop at those same tables and sign out your name and the time. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel for today, uh, starting with uh, an affiliate member uh, of GAR. And uh, we're, we're going to just let him do his introduction because uh, he can do it much better than I. But ladies and gentlemen, this is Bruce Fike, and he's going to be leading the charge today. Morning. Thanks so much for coming out today. Nothing draws a crowd uh, better than free continuing education credits. Am I right? So, my name is Bruce Fike. I am the district manager for the Albuquerque office of uh, First Command. Um, let me tell you how I got here. So the reason I, I uh, Nick didn't give you a good introduction is that uh, nobody knows who the hell I am. I'm a new guy here, right? So I just moved here from Colorado Springs in August where I was an affiliate member of the Pikes Peak Association of Realtors for a couple years and really enjoyed that. Had a good time working with those folks. And so when I moved to Albuquerque, that's one of the, actually the first things I did was join the, uh, the GAR. Is that the, can I say GAR? I guess all, all, all the new people I meet, I have to, you know, I'm telling about a brief I'm doing at the Greater Albuquerque Association of Realtors. It takes, you know, 10 minutes to say. So GAR, that's good. I'm glad that works. Um, so I came to my first meeting, I think it was September, October. And, you know, I, uh, they start talking about the, these Q&A sessions, and they have a list of some topics that they want to do. And they, uh, they throw out a couple different ones, and they, they go, and uh, financial planning for realtors. And somebody I don't know looks at me, points, and goes, hey, that new guy said he was a financial advisor. And so that's why I'm here today. So, uh, so you can say, I think Rob was his name at the time. So I um, appreciate you guys coming out. It, uh, let me... Um, let me tell you a little bit about our company. You probably haven't heard of us, First Command. We are primarily a company that works with military members. Um, and most of our, our advisors in First Command 
are retired militaries like myself, 30 years Air Force, um, veterans, military spouses. Uh, that's, our, that's kind of our niche. And we don't advertise, so that's, that's probably another reason why you haven't heard of us. But um, you know, we, are, we do complimentary financial planning for military families and others. Um, so that's kind of our, our mission in life. Um, again, any, um, any retired military in here? I always like to connect. <coughs> Sir, what branch were you in? Air Force. Cool. Uh, good for you. What uh, would you do? Uh, the medic. Oh, okay. Here you go. Thank you for service. All right. <laughs> Sir, what'd you do? Air Force. 22 years. I love it. Well, well, pilot. Great. Thanks, sir. Your name looks familiar, actually. Uh, you may have to talk. Were you my wing commander at one point? <laughs> I didn't do it, I swear. All right. No, thanks for your service, guys. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, and uh, it, you know, it's just uh, it's great to have some fellow uh, Air Force folks in the room, even if you are a pilot, sir. I won't hold that against you. <laughs> Sorry, nobody gets that but the you know, military folks. OK, um, so what, uh, what are our goals today? This isn't to, to uh, make you an expert on all of these, these different things that we're going to talk about for financial planning. It's to give you a good overview of what's available to you as realtors. So we'll get, we'll get into that. So uh, before we get started, um, I want to introduce my team to you who I have here. Um, so way in the back there, Brian, raise your hand. Brian Mueller just got in off the plane from Dallas, Texas. He... Uh, as you can see here, Vice President of Marketing and Training for uh, CompEdge. They basically are the company that vets all of our um, annuity insurance, long-term care products for us, make sure we have the best products out there, and they do a lot of education and training for us. So I appreciate Brian being here today to, to lend some expertise during the Q&A. Also, Craig Ligori, who is a Business Development Director with First Command. Came all the way out from Arizona. He sent me a picture of him standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona yesterday. It was such a fine sight to see. I wish I had incorporated it in my, my slide now. Oh, well, regret. It's a bad thing. But Craig, where are you at, Craig? Where the heck is you <laughs> Craig, it's no time to get breakfast when I'm introducing you. That's not good. So anyway, that's Craig Lagore back there. He's, uh, he's our tax expert. He, he's an expert on uh, tax-efficient retirement income. That's the guy you want to talk to when you want to make sure that your, you know, your money in retirement is, is working for you well and you're not paying an excess amount of taxes. So he's going to do a piece of this briefing when it comes down to the uh, tax-efficient retirement income. Um, I also have one of my new advisors, Bethany Brandt. Bethany, raise your hand, stand up. Bethany, uh, brand new to our company, uh, on fire to, uh, to do some good stuff with us. Uh, absolutely crushing it right now, and we're really excited to have her. And also, not on here, but he, he texted me this morning and said, hey, can I come to the realtor thing? Mike Waring in the back, he's my newest hire. He starts with us on uh, April 16th. So excited to have, uh, have those folks on our team. Now, like I said, I, I did work with a lot of realtors in Colorado Springs. And you know, the more I worked with them, the more I found these similarities that were that we had as realtors and financial advisors, actually. So I, I just we have very similar business models, if you believe it or not. Um, you know, what's the first thing you, you do pretty much when you meet with someone that wants to buy a house? What's that? Screen them. Oh. You. <laughs> okay, well, we have a very pragmatic approach to uh, real estate. Are they qualified? No, get out. All right. So. <laughs> we'll just go to the next slide. No, I would like to think that some of it is you actually sit down and talk to them about what their goals are. What kind of, what size house do you want? How many car garage? What, you know, all that good stuff, right? Is that, uh, hopefully that's something. And then sitting down and talking to them about what their budget is for their, for their house, how much can they afford to uh, to put down on mortgage or down payment, all that, right? So we sit down and, and you figure out their goals and their budget. We do that, and then if you've done a good job with figuring out their goals and understanding their budget, and you find them a house that meets all that, and you walk them into that house, what happens? Anybody? They ooh and they ah. And they buy it. Do you have to sell them anything? You have to go, hey, you really, hey, this is a great house. You really need it. This is perfect. No, no, no. You, you did your job. You, you understood their goals and you understood their budget and you're going to meet their needs. Um, you guys work for free, right? Pretty much until you sign the contract. You know, no. <laughs> like, Hell no. It's like, yeah, we're not working for free. 
most of us, maybe newer in the business, are, uh, you know, we're, we, we meet with people, we get to know them, we, we do all this data gathering. We, you know, you guys go and they put, put these plans together and you drive around all week or weekend and show them houses, right? And that's all on your dime, right? So complimentary assistance. You know, you're doing a lot of education on it. You're, you're, you're helping them understand what they need to do for the loan process and what, what different, uh, all the paperwork and all the fun stuff that goes on. You know, that's, that's part of your job. And then paid on commission, like if, if they don't, if you don't, uh, I don't know if maybe some of you have other arrangements. Like, what's his name, Roger? Is it Keith, why don't I say Keith? It's like Keith here, <laughs> he gets his money up front apparently. But mostly like we don't get paid until, until, the, until the sale post, right? So getting paid on commission. So that's how we're very, very similar in um, what we do. The other thing is that we're, we're 1099 employees, most of us, I'm going to assume that's why you're here. And uh, you don't have that company-sponsored retirement plan. And so while there are a lot of advantages to being a realtor, obviously, I mean, I'm going to assume most of you have pretty, pretty good control over your schedule. You work when you want to work. I mean, I was having a discussion with Taryn in the back there with the... Yeah, you get, you get to run your own schedule, but you know, most of us probably work you know, more in these kind of jobs and we did regular nine to five jobs because we love what we do and we see the benefit. We're helping people, we're doing good things. And uh, yeah, and also the, you know, you have unlimited income potential. The more you hustle, the, the more you can make, right? So those are the good advantages of, of what you guys do and what we do as a, as a financial advisor. So, but I want to focus on the downside, the disadvantages that you don't have any preset you know, 401ks or things like that that are company sponsored to help you get going with your retirement goals. All right. I always like to set a baseline with my clients. Whenever I meet with somebody, I always tell them this. There are no dumb questions about your money, okay? That's meant to kind of take, you know, everybody thinks that they're supposed to understand money, how it works, and you know what? A lot of people don't, and that's fine. It's just like your clients. Like you don't expect them to know everything, all the ins and outs about how you how to deal with paperwork and, and buy a house, right? You you ask them questions. You're 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 patient with them. You be you know you you get an understanding where they're at. So so that's what we want to do too today. Actually, you know, we wanna, I want to set some baselines because I do this exact thing with my clients. Uh, I usually do it in a reverse order. Uh, I usually ask people, um, do you know what a mutual fund is? And 90% of them go, yeah, I know what a mutual fund is. And I go, tell me what a mutual fund is. And then I get the, uh, well, uh, uh, I've kind of heard of it, right? So then I start backing it up. What's a stock? Do you know what a stock is? Anybody tell me what a stock is? Raise your hand. Go ahead, be brave. Tell me what a stock is. I promise there are no dumb questions about your money or stock. Nobody knows what a stock is. <laughs> I got a Starbucks gift card with somebody's name on it. Tell me what it is. Tell me what it is. <laughs> there you go. Partial ownership in a company. Very good. Thank you very much for being brave and when there's money attached to it. <laughs> That's exactly right. You, you own a piece of a, you own a, a piece of a company, right? Anybody want to venture about bonds? I got another Starbucks card. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna leave this for you, ma'am. <laughs> so bonds, you know, are basically loans that you're, you're loaning money to a company. If they want to, uh, if they want to have money to in, improve their operations, expand their operations, what have you, they want to raise money, they they issue bonds. Now, a bond is just basically you're the bank in this situation. And so. If Amazon wanted to, to, to issue a bond to raise money to put new distribution centers out, they could pay a very low interest rate because you, you know Amazon. You are very comfortable with Amazon and you're confident you're going to get your money back, right? But if Joe's Taco Shop down the road wanted to expand, they would have to pay out a higher interest rate on their bonds. Make sense? It's like having good credit, bad credit. Okay? Is that like treasury bonds? The treasury bonds? We're talking about corporate bonds. If a company wanted to issue a bond to expand their, their operations and things like that. So, treasury bonds would be set by the government, depending on what the interest rates are and things like that. So, good, good question. Uh, and then mutual funds. So, mutual funds, basically a collection of hundreds of different stocks and, and or bonds, depending on the, what, what's made up in, to, uh, 
to help mitigate risk. Now, that's our philosophy at First Command is we do a lot of our wealth building through mutual funds. We don't, we, we want to make sure that we, we focus on long-term growth. We're not looking to get rich quick. Um, you know, we don't call our, our clients up and go, hey, we need 10 grand for I got a hot stock tip. Um, you know, we want to be able to provide them with, with, with consistent, steady growth over time. Because stocks are, you know, stocks are volatile. I mean, you know, look, I, I've got a Robinhood account. I mess around with, with different stocks, but I don't have my, my retirement money in there. Um, but a lot of people do, and they have money in, and you know, like I said, Amazon and, and Google and Tesla and all these things. And, and those are great companies right now. And, and, you know, between you and me, I think Amazon's going to take over the world at some points. But, um, but we just, you just don't know. When you're, when you're only invested in a few stocks, that's very, it can be very volatile. And the, the best analogy I can make of that is, how many of you have been to a Blockbuster video? <laughs> Would you like to buy some Blockbuster video stock? <laughs> I have some very cheap that I will sell you today. So, so that's the point, and that's why we, we focus on mutual funds. Any, any, any questions about any of that, real quick? No? Okay. Oh, sir? Just an FYI. Blockbuster had a chance to buy Netflix. Is that, have you seen that, that documentary on, on uh, Netflix? <laughs> Weird. <laughs> the big banner, the dumbasses. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they did. They, had, they definitely had, they, they didn't see the future. They, were, right. they, they, they didn't want to lose out on late fees. That was their, their biggest thing. So, you know, because you're late with your butt, your tape, or you don't rewind it, whatever, they charge you. That's what they were holding on to. Dumbasses. All right. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so now we've kind of got an idea of a little bit about investment types. Let's get into what the specifics, what's available to you as a 1099 employee. How can you invest in your retirement? So we'll start from the uh, kind of the, the, the basics. I think most people are familiar with this uh, traditional IRA. Um, IRA, individual retirement account. I realize I just now I should have spelled that out. Um, a lot of people ask, like, why can't my spouse see my my IRA account online? Because it's the I stands for individual. So know that. So when you ask uh, somebody that question, you'll know. Okay, so basically an IRA is a way to put money into an investment. It's a tax treatment of your of your retirement money. And depending on what type it is, pre-tax or after tax, traditional IRA is pre-tax. For 2024, you can put up to seven thousand dollars in your traditional IRA. If you're like me and you're 50 plus, you can do eight thousand. Um, fun fact for all you religious folks out there: if you divide eight thousand by 12, you get six 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 dot six six. Some of my clients just say, "Can we round that down to a six sixty five? Sure. We don't want that. Yeah, we don't want to have bad juju there. So anyway, just have fun. It's just fun fact. Uh, your your contributions. Are you're able to deduct them unless you or your spouse are, are covered by a retirement plan, and then there's different limits. But obviously, the audience we have today that most of you are not um, covered by a retirement plan. Um, it is tax-free growth. All the money that you invest in a traditional IRA will grow tax-free. Um, when you do decide to take the money out. The money, it's, um, you're going to pay the pay income tax on And you have to wait until you're 59 and a half before you can start taking distributions out of, out of a, a retirement account, IRA. Okay? Here's the thing that my clients absolutely hate. These required minimum distributions. It's very bad. They, uh, because what's going to happen is the government's giving you this tax break because you can write off the contributions uh, on your taxes now. But... When you're 73, and that age is going up to 75 by 2033, um, yeah, um, they're gonna, they want their money back. They've uh, they've given you a good deal on um, on your taxes, and now they want their money. And their their hope is that you, the tree, or sorry, this you know, would you rather pay taxes on the seed or the tree? They're hoping that money grows over time, so that that when they you have to start taking the money out. It's a bigger pot of money. So that's, and that's part of the conversation that Craig will have about um, tax efficient retirement income. But it's a, but I will tell you that, you know, people don't think about it. There's a lot of people pouring money into traditional IRAs and they don't, they're, they're thinking, well, I want the tax break, I want the tax break. Well, I can tell you that all the 73 year old plus 
clients that I have that sit in my office are pissed off that they have to take money out that they might not necessarily need. Maybe they have a pension, their other investment, Social Security, all that stuff. Like they may not need to take that money at all. And especially retired retired folks, retired military, like you know, we're never going to need to touch any of that money. So anyway, that's something to consider. And again, Craig will get more into that with um, with his discussion. So. And all that, all that distribution does is when you have to take the money out, it just adds to your taxable income for the year. And that could bump you up into another tax bracket, things like that. The other thing that a lot of people don't consider is, has anybody looked at the tax brackets, the difference between married, filing joint, and single? It's significant, isn't it? Like if you're single, you're basically double taxed, you know? So that's another thing to consider. Like when you're, you're older and you're married, you know, one someone's well, one both of you. There's a 98.4 percent chance that one or both of you are going to die, right? So, thank you for the laugh. Um, people are like, "What is that?" Right? I don't know. Um, so, but when when a spouse dies, then the other one's in the single tax bracket. That's the point I'm trying to get to with my ill-conceived joke. All right, let's talk about the the, the brother of uh, the traditional IRS. Let's talk about the Roth. We love the Roth. The Roth's are great, right? Roth is, is after tax. You don't pay the taxes. I mean, yeah, you, you don't get any kind of tax break on it, but you're able to grow your money tax-free. And there are certain income limits. The, the contribution limits are the same. Um, there's also income limits with this. A lot of people get tripped up on this when they see these numbers. Well, I, can't, I made a lot of money last year. I can't contribute to a Roth. That's not exactly true. The, uh, the IRS has provisions for what they call backdoor Roths, recharacterization of, of contributions. So you can do it. You just have to do the right paperwork shuffle to, to make it all clean in the eyes of the IRS. But we do it every year. I have my list of clients that I need to do recharacterizations for, and they've got their money in the Roth. So, so something to think about. If, you're, if, you, if you didn't think that you could contribute to a Roth because your income, that uh, we need to have a chat. So. Uh, tax-free growth, tax-free dis, dis, distributions. That's the that's the fun part of the Ross. Um, you know, you you know, you don't ever have to pay taxes on that money ever again. And that's where we start talking about Roth conversions, getting your money into Roth now. If you have traditional, you can do that now. Pay taxes now. Again, that's a that's a Craig conversation, but he'll he'll point that out for you. Um, penalties, yeah. Uh, just like oh, I, did, I meant to bring up about traditional too. You know, there are, there's a, you know, 10% penalties for if you take money out before 59 and a half. Um, you know, in, in the case of a, a Roth, you actually, a lot of people don't know this, you can take your contributions out of a Roth whenever you want. You can, you can put your money in one day and take it out the next and without any penalties because you you're, you're paying tax on that money, right? So, but anything that you earn, any gains on that Roth are going to be subject to a penalty, right? Just know that, okay? And the other thing, thing we like a lot are no required minimum distributions. That's a, that's a fantastic feature. The, you, you do not have to, yeah. Could you comment a little bit more on the income limits? So these are the, uh, the 146 and the, the 230. That's your, um, you know, out, M MFJ, married, file, and joint. That's your uh, modified just gross income for the year. If your income falls under that, then you can contribute to a Roth. Now again, if it's over that, we can do it, we can do the back to a Roth. We can do re-characterization of your, of your contributions. Why is the second number not twice the first number? I don't know. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, doesn't do good in your fighter pilot mind, does it? No, <laughs> that's not math. I know, well, it's the IRS that does this, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's the answer. It's the government. When does the government make a lot of sense? Never. Okay. Um, so there. Sorry. Yeah. I can call somebody. <laughs> Actually, uh, yes, sir. So the the income limit is what did you say? Modified AGR. Modified. Yes. And can you define that for us? It's just when you do your taxes, like line forty three on your taxes. After you get all your deductions and everything, that 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 number is what you're they're looking at. If you're under the if that I think it's line forty three, right? Oh, Craig. So, so to calculate your modified adjusted gross income, IRS publication 590 alpha page, I think it's like 40 or 42, there's a table 2TAC1. There's a very simple worksheet that you can walk through that will 
tell you how to calculate what your modified adjusted gross income is. So it starts with your adjusted gross income from your tax return, and then you add back in certain things for that year that the IRS thinks that should be included back into it. So, Do you have any idea what those items might be? Uh, foreign... Go to publication. Uh, I'm sorry? To get a rough idea of, of what kind of income, I mean, income implies like gross income. Yeah, so it's going to be your. You start out with this your. You start out with your adjusted gross income from your tax return, and then you subtract out any conversions that you did from your uh, traditional IRA, and then we're going to add back in things like excluded foreign uh, income taxes that you were paying, um, student loan, uh, student loan interest that you were you were taking off your tax return. So the, the list changes every year. Like previously, they would add back in municipal bonds. They're not doing that because municipal bonds really don't pay anything now. So it's, uh, you just walk. So there are very few things that get added back into the equation. Correct. So for the most part, your adjusted gross income will be your modified adjusted gross income. Yep. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Good questions. Uh, where are we at? Uh, required distributions. You know, and the other thing about that is that I don't have it on the slide. When when you're talking about the difference between Roth and traditional, when it comes to your heirs and legacy planning, um, if your heirs in, inherit a traditional IRA or 401k, they have to liquidate that within 10 years, and then that just adds to their their taxable income. With a Roth, yes, they have to liquidate it in 10 years, but they don't pay any tax on it, and they can literally let it sit in there and grow for you know, nine years, 11 months, 29 days, and then take it all out, and then take advantage of that tax free growth over time. So that's another good, good way, um, you know, that Roth helps you with your, with your retirement planning and your legacy plan. All right, here's some other types of things that, uh, that you have available to you. As a, as a business owner, self-employed, you're allowed to do the, the Simplified Employee Pension or SEP IRA. Anybody ever SEP? Can we do it in a um, The great thing about this is you see the, the contribution limits. You can get up to $69,000 a year in a set. Now, it depends on what your, obviously what your income was, you know, lesser of 25% or the $69,000, whichever. Um, but it's a way to get a lot of money into a retirement plan really quick. You have a really big year as a, as a realtor, boom, you can, you can do that. Here's the downside. The downside is it's still considered like a traditional IRA. So you're still, you, you get the tax deduction, which is great because it's a big chunk of tax deduction, uh, especially if you're, if you're up to the max. But then you're going to deal with that problem at 73 when you have to take the distribution, right? So, so that's, um, there, there, were, there are provisions in the Secure Act 2.0 for a Roth SEP IRA. Um, that uh, that but that they haven't put all the mechanisms in place for that to happen yet. I think is I, am I still right on that, Craig? Okay. All right, cool. And just because you're contributing to a SEP doesn't you can also contribute to a traditional or a Roth IRA as well. So um, good way to really really double up your your retirement income. Right. Again, ten percent penalty if you're taking distribution for fifty nine and a half. But uh, uh, that's the. The draw of that. Let's talk about. So can you can you max out a uh, regular IRA and then a Roth IRA and then this one all at the same time? So for a tr either a traditional IRA, you can put eight seven thousand. Well, come here, seven thousand eight thousand dollars a year in an IRA. It did, it did one or the other, right? Okay. So but you can't do both. Good question. Though. You can't do eight thousand in both or seven thousand in both a Roth, a Roth IRA and a traditional IRA. But you can put like eight, seven thousand in a, a traditional IRA and sixty nine thousand in a, uh, a SEP IRA. Can. Mm -hmm. Yep, you can do both. Yep, for a SEP. Yep. And same for for uh, the simple. So simple IRA. Um, again, you, you can't put quite as much money into this. The, the the major difference between this, the simple, and the SEP is that the SEP is all employer contributions, whereas an employee can also contribute to the, to the simple IRA. And again, this is, you know, I don't know if anybody is, is, if you're crushing it where you have more than 100 employees, God bless you. Um, 
But uh, it's, so that's what it's available to. Rules are pretty much the same as all the other IRAs, traditional in the, in the set. Um, but then you are required to make contribution in your employees' accounts. Here's the one I really like, this one. If, uh, if you're a business owner and the only, and, and if the only other person working for you is your spouse, you can do a solo 401k plan. And you can see the contribution limit. That's a, that's a mix of your contributions as the employee and your contributions as the employer. And if your spouse is working for you, you can also do that for them. So that's a really great way to get um, even more money into a retirement plan if that's your situation. Um, and the, uh, what was I gonna say, the other? Oh, the other good thing is that you can open this up as a Roth. So you can immediately dump all this money into a Roth solo 401k. And uh, like we said, that's, that's where we'd like to have our money in retirement. And, and, and again, you set one for yourself and your spouse if they're working for you. So this is a really great, great option. Okay, so I've thrown some really basic, not basic, these are, these are the, the main avenues available for 1099 employees to, uh, to get money into retirement accounts. Um, but now, you know, how do we make that efficient? What's a, the best way that we can, uh, can, can maximize what we're doing and, you know, avoid paying as many taxes as, as possible? So I'm going to have Craig come up and he's going to go into the, are you going to, can you come up here or do you want me to? No, you don't want to come here? All right, he's shy. So, anyway, Craig's going to talk a little bit about the um, tax efficient retirement strategies and, uh, and fun things like that. So, thank you, Craig. I appreciate right. it. Thank you very much, Bruce. All right, so everyone, let's start. Uh, can everyone do, do me a favor, put a hand up, please? All right, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and if you think it, if you agree with it, then take your hand down. So, who here wants to pay more in taxes? No, you agree with it. So you all, you all, you all, you all want to pay more taxes than the government. Okay. So if you want to, if you want to pay less in taxes, keep your hand up. All right. Who here wants less money? So you all want to lose money. And who wants less control? So who wants the government telling you more of what you can do with your money? If that's the case, put your hand down. So the, the, whole, the whole idea is what we look at from a financial planning standpoint is what are the steps that the government allows you to do today with your money that will allow you to have more money, more control of your money, so that you can pay less in taxes. Does that sound like something you all are interested in? What's up? You give me an inquisitive look, sir. Given a little bit of a quick, okay. So that's the idea is we want more money, more control, and less in taxes, okay? So in the financial industry, we have something that's called the tax diversification triangle. This is going to be time tested across, you know, as long as, you know, for as long as we have had money, is that there's three primary places where you can put your money. The first place that we have is called the tax free area. Does anyone have any idea what might be in the tax free area? Roths. Your Roth IRA, your Roth 401k if you have that option. Anything else? Any, anyone else have other options? Anyone here have kids that are high school age right now? Planning to go to college? So what's what's the term usually associated with uh, planning for college? It was 529. 529 plans. I love it. We also look at using life insurance strategies. That's another option. Municipal bonds. So anyone here whose spouse works for a company that has an employer-sponsored health plan? So if you're getting uh, health insurance from your from the employer more than likely you're eligible to have something that's called a health savings account. Is that something you all have heard about? That's another thing that's gonna be included in the tax-free area. So as the tax code has changed and these things have been added to uh, the tax code, then that has changed our, uh, our menu of items that we can choose from. Anyone here, this is a little bit more of a sensitive one, but anyone here have uh, someone in their family 
that's been diagnosed with some kind of a long-term life, you know, long-term disability, like, you know, like autism or Down syndrome, something of that nature. Well, there's something out there that's called an ABLE account that came around in 2014. An ABLE account is another way that you can save to provide for the health, education, maintenance, and support for that individual with the, uh, the thought process being more than likely that individual may not be going to college. So let's try and save some dollars, get some tax benefits to provide for something that is more likely going to be used for. Um, so here's some examples of, uh, of the tax-free area. Yes, ma'am. Can that be for a grandchild? Yes. <clears throat> so, sorry? It can be for a grandchild, but it has to be claimed in your tax return. For your ABLE account. And like parents have one and grandparents have one? So that's a, that's a great question. The question that was just asked is, you know, can the parents or the grandparents have one? So an ABLE account is very similar to a 529 account, but they're also very different. So for example, I can have a 529 for my kids. Their grandparents can have 529s for the grandkids and everything else. So my son can have three, four, five, six, seven, eight 529 accounts that are for that kid's benefit. The ABLE account, that individual is only allowed to have one account set up for their benefit. So that individual has the account and then everyone else can contribute into it, where for the 529s, everyone can have an account, name the kid as the beneficiary, and then use those funds to pay out for the beneficiary. Yes, ma'am. On, on, on a 529, you can change the beneficiary. Correct. On the ABLE account, if the child passes away, um, yeah. Where does that money go? That money will, that's a great question. I'm going to have to do some research on that. But like, for example, the, the 529 accounts, you know, my son and my daughter each have a 529 account. My son didn't clean up his room like he told it to. Well, guess what? My daughter just got a $100,000 account for her college benefit. I can flip flop them back and forth if I want to. Now that's going to come into other changes that have come around. But with the 529 accounts, you can change who the beneficiary is. The ABLE accounts, you're not able to change that beneficiary. Yeah, can you send an email to all of us? Uh, to that question, that's interesting. So with the, with the ABLE accounts, I think what, you know, the ABLE account, similar to the L savings account, once the child passes, once the individual passes away, it's going to be dispersed to the beneficiaries for them to go spend it. Uh, and then when they receive them, there's going to be certain rules and regulations governing how they have to take that money out. Any other questions on that? All right. So the next area in the tax triangle, we have what's called the taxable account. And so that's going to be, as you're looking at, that's going to be the, in the uh, as you're looking at it in the lower left-hand corner where the T is, so you want to look at your taxable account similar to, think about your, uh, your checking account or what you have at the bank. You can have a checking account in your name. You and your spouse can share one. That would be a joint account. So you might have a, you might have a uh, checking account that's both that you share with your spouse, another family member, a business partner. Similar to like if you have a, uh, so I live in Arizona, which is a community property state. So you know, you can, you know, depending on if you have, you know, how you have the house registered is that, you know, the house might be registered in one person's name, it might be jointly registered, or you could also put the house in the name of the trust. How you register the house is going to dictate what happens at, at passing and also with the tax treatment and everything else. But bottom line is that with the taxable account, so Arizona, we have the Mega Millions and the Powerball. Do you guys have Powerball, Mega Millions. So anyone, like you all are here, so I'm assuming no one, no one here won the won the billion dollars. Okay. So 
If you were to win the billion dollars, well, what ends up happening is that you win the billion dollars, you take the lump sum payout, so it's $500 million. After you pay the taxes, it's $250 million. You can walk into the bank with your gigantic check for $250 million, and no one is ever going to tell you that you can't put it all into your bank account at one time. <laughs> at the same time, no one is ever going to call you up and say, you know what, you got to take this money out of the account. But what ends up happening is you're going to have to deal with the consequences of the dividends and the capital gains and all the investment income that comes along with it. So ultimately, when you're filing your taxes, you're going to be waiting year over year to get that information coming in. That's always going to delay you filing your taxes. But that's why we call it the taxable accounts, because it's a continual tax, taxable situation that you're going to deal with. And then finally, you have what's called the tax deferred. So this is going to be things like your 401ks, your 403bs. Uh, in the, for the government workers, we have what's called the thrift savings plan. And then you have your IRAs. Bottom line is that you get paid, your money automatically goes into the taxable account, and it continues to grow. You don't have to worry about dividends or capital gains. But once you start taking the dollars out of your traditional IRA, your traditional 401k, your traditional simple or SEP IRA, now you're going to have to pay the taxes at ordinary income tax rates. So quick show of hands, where do you all think tax rates are going to go in the future? No, they're not. Anyway, so remember what George Bush said, read my lips, no new taxes? He didn't raise taxes, he just created new taxes. We created new things that you, know, that you don't necessarily realize, is a realize are a tax. So you know, everyone here, you, know, you all own property, and everyone pays property taxes. But when you pay property taxes, that all of a sudden mean that your potholes on your street go away? <laughs> no, no one, gets better, no one gets better roads. You don't get any better tree trimming service or anything else. It, it's a government service, so everyone gets the exact same benefits that are out there. So with the tax deferred accounts, the reason why they're pretty popular is because they were, they were created back in the 1970s, when the highest marginal tax rate was 70%. So if you filed your taxes back in the 1970s, married filing jointly, there are 25 different tax brackets between zero and $200,000. So at that time frame, frame, what everyone was saying around the water cooler is defer, 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 because when you retire, you're going to be at a lower tax bracket. Does everyone generally agree with that sentiment? If there are 25 different tax brackets, you're married filing jointly, so it doesn't take much for your income to go down in retirement that you'd be in a lower tax bracket. Well, the top tax break that we have today is 37%. That starts north of $600,000. And now we have, seven, we have seven tax brackets. So generally speaking, that for you to drop to a lower tax bracket in retirement, you're going to have to take a, a substantial reduction in your standard of living to drop to a lower tax bracket. And after you guys have been working your entire lives, I don't think you, the thought process um, is that in retirement, you're going to then gravitate back to being at home and uh, being, sick, being sick like you were in school, watching the prices right. So you can see here where historical tax rates were. We had the, the spike back during World War II in the 70s, you know, we were at 70%. And then we pretty much been at, you know, 30, 37%, 39% bouncing back and forth. But the underlying brackets along the way, they've changed. And then Congress has also come up with new ways to, so they've created what's called provisional income. So what provisional income is, is another way to tax your social security benefits. Everyone will, you all know, pay into Social Security with the expectation you're going to receive your Social Security. But when you receive your Social Security, some may be taxed on it, others may not be taxed on it. So it's a way of means testing it. Anyone in here 65 or older? Y'all on Med Medicare? Yep. Does the phrase Irma mean anything to you all? Yeah. 
Yeah, you don't, you don't like IRMA, right? IRMA stands for your Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. So here's a quick little education on Medicare. There's four parts to Medicare. You have your Medicare Part A, your B, your C, and your D. Medicare Part A is your hospital insurance. If you've been working long enough and you qualify for it, you don't have to worry about paying for Medicare Part A. <coughs> Part D is your prescription drug service. Part C is your, uh, that's your Medicare plan. Okay, so that's where they talk about the, uh, the donut hole. Put it another way, if uh, probably around 12 to 3 o'clock um, in the afternoon and you watch some kind of 24-hour news station, first, uh, first commercial out of the shoot is going to be talking about Medicare. That's what they're talking about is that's where you can go and you can get uh, commercial, insur commercial medical insurance to pay for it. So the one final thing you got to look at is your Medicare Part B premiums. So with your Medicare Part B, the premiums that you pay every year is going to be based on the tax return that you filed two years ago. So the premiums that you're paying this year, ma'am, for 2024 is based on the tax return you filed in 2022. Tax return you're filing right now will dictate your premiums that you pay in 2025. The reason why I bring this up is because you may pay $174 per person per month, and I'm going to pay, you pay a lot more than that. Okay. Okay, so you pay $540 per person per month. I pay $174 per person per month. But even though you're paying $540 and I'm paying $174, Medicare is a government plan. So we all get the same benefit, which means that you can't cut me in line when we go to Walgreens. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, Alzheimer's curable for you and not for me. So what that means is that you're not going to get a, any additional benefits. It's a government service. Everyone gets the exact same benefits. So in essence, when I've talked to clients about this concept, they've stopped me about two minutes into it and they said, it's a tax. It's not Irma, it's not anything else, it's a tax. I'm paying more, I get the exact same benefits. So. Why we talk about, why this is so important to talking about how we can rearrange your dollars to give you more control so you can pay less in taxes so that ultimately you can have more money later on in retirement is because when the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was passed, what it did, it, it lowered the tax rates. So that now you're going to have lower tax rates, wider tax brackets, and filing your taxes is easier than it was previously. So I know that uh, a lot of you all probably can't see. Can, can you all see, <coughs> make out some of this? Okay. So I'll walk you all through this. So the column that you're looking at in the center of this chart represents the current year tax rates. And you can see that the current year tax rates are 10%, 12%, 22, 24, 32, 35, and 37 percent. And the color bands represent where the brackets will change. Now you have to remember with the tax code, it's a progressive tax system, so your income is going to be subject to the various brackets as your income goes up. So let's say you're making $500,000. Not everything is, you're not paying 35 percent on everything, you're only paying 35 percent on your income that goes from 462,000 up to 500,000. Okay. When the law was written, it was set with an expiration date that December 31st, 2025, we're going to go back to the tax rates that we had in 2017 unless Congress can uh, unless Congress steps in and makes a change. Who here thinks Congress will actually do something? <laughs> They're going to do it at the last minute like they always do. So the way the law stands is that the current tax rates will expire, and we're going to go back to the tax rates that we had in 2017. And you can see that those tax rates are 10, 15, 25, 28, 33%. So that's why I say the rates that we have today are lower, our brackets are wider, and filing your taxes is easier. So one of the ways you get dollars into a Roth IRA 
is either through contributions or you can also do the conversions. Conversions, it's a simple paperwork exercise, but you're gonna have to pay the taxes. So you convert, let's just say $100,000, when you file your taxes April 15th, you're gonna have to pay a $24,000 tax bill, potentially, keeping math simple. Because what's gonna end up happening is that life expectancy, so if you're, you know, let's say you're 60 years old today, so life expectancy for males who are age 60 is age 80. And for females who are age 60, your life expectancy is 84. So if you're married and you're around the same age as your spouse, more than likely, one spouse will end up predeceasing the other spouse. And when that happens, the very next year, the surviving spouse becomes a single taxpayer. And you can see how much more unfavorable those single tax rates are. And so that's why we look at is how can we continue to save for retirement that gives you the control because if you're being told to take $50,000 out of your traditional IRA, but you don't need that for spending purposes, is that you really controlling your money? No. That's the government telling you because the government wants their tax revenue. Whereas with the Roth IRA, there are no required distributions. So if you don't need the money, then you don't have to take the money out of there. So this is a simple way we look at, you know, taking advantage of what your, uh, how to go about doing a conversion. So you have $100,000 gross income, take off your deductions and any contributions. So let's just say your taxable income is $70,000. You do a conversion and what ends up happening? So you do a conversion of twenty thousand dollars. That means that you're going to have to pay uh, you're going to have to pay about four thousand dollars in state and federal taxes to do that conversion. Now, the reason why I do that strategy is because right now I'm forty six years old. When I'm in my I convert twenty thousand dollars today. Rule of seventy two says that money should double every decade. So why, by the time I'm in my seventies, that twenty thousand dollars will grow to be about one hundred sixty thousand dollars of tax free. So I can take the dollars out if I need to. And more importantly, if I take those dollars out from my Roth IRA, I'm not going to pay higher Medicare taxes. And I'm not going to pay any tax. It's not going to cause my Social Security benefits to be taxed either. So that way, I can receive my Social Security benefits tax-free. And so that's why we look at is you have to remember in your IRA, in your traditional retirement accounts, if you have a traditional retirement account, you'll look at it on paper, you may have $500,000. Well, you have $500,000 on paper, but you're only going down to Costco, you're only going to spend $350,000 because the other $150,000 is going to go to the government in the form of taxes. So that's where we look at, you got to look at what your purchasing power is versus what, your, what, your, uh, what you have on paper. Greg, I appreciate that. So, okay, now you know a little bit about the different vehicles that are available to you to get money into investment accounts for your retirement. Craig's talked to, um, about the tax efficient strategies. Now, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with that? Here's the, here's the deal. Here's, there's three variables that are gonna control what you have in retirement. Your input, how much money you put into your investments, your rate of return, and the amount of time that you spend investing. Um, what's the thing that you're, you're most concerned about but have the least control over? Rate of return, you wanna make money, right? Where do you have the most control in very well, for the most part? In top, you know, your time, well, yeah, you can put, you, well, you're limited to certain amounts of money, you put in different things, but, but your time. You know, um, you know, compound interest, the earlier you start, the more you'll have. And, you know, Albert Einstein said, you know, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And it's true. I'm going to show you a little illustration that kind of that bears that out. So we have a couple, couple folks here. We have Lisa. We have her. She's putting $200 into a 401k every month between the ages of 30 and 40. And then that's it. She's going to put another dime in. And then Dylan waits till he's 40 and then contributes $200 a month 
until he's 65. And at 8%, you can see that even though Lisa's not putting another dime in there, that she's going to have more money just because of that power of compound interest and how it works. It's, you know, it's, you know, I show it to young folks in my office, like, you know, they're young and they're like, I got time, I got time. You start showing the future value of money calculators and they're like, where do I sign? Um, you know, because if you start this early enough, you know, it's, it's very powerful. So, so again, I would just implore you, if you haven't started, you know, when's, when's the best time to start? When you were 18. When's the second best time to start? Now. So, um, yeah, so that's a good illustration of, of, of the power of compound interest and why it doesn't pay to wait. <clears throat> All right. Here's some other things that we want to consider when we're doing our finance plan. We hit the, the tax-efficient retirement income strategy pretty hard because it's important. Those are, You need to understand where your money's going, how you can make it work for you in, uh, in the most efficient way possible when you retire. Um, obviously, uh, not obviously, the, uh, a lot of people, and a lot of people short on this, the emergency fund. Have some money available in, in a, you know, just a high yield savings account or something like that, where if you have an emergency, you can take the money out of there without having to liquidate your, your investments, because we see that all the time. And that just, that just derails your compound interest rate, right? You, you know, when you, you start pulling stuff out of there, there are tax implications, what have you. Have some cash on hand to, to handle, you know, three to six months is a good rule of thumb. Uh, Pre-retirement goals, that's an interesting one that I run into a lot, with, especially with military folks that are retired, because they put all their money into um, the, you know, the military retirement account, that, that thrift savings plan, which is a 401k, basically, they, or Roth, and then they have money in Roth IRAs, all these other retirement accounts, and then they retire from the military in their 40s, and they're like, I want to buy a house, or I want to I get buy some land, or, or what have you, and they can't touch any of that money. Because it's all retirement money. If we took 59 and a half. So that's something to consider. What do you want to do before you retire? What, what kind of pots of money can we get going? Investments to, uh, to meet those pre-retirement goals so you can have access to the money. Income protection for your family. I mean, if something were to happen to you, uh, you know, what's, what's your plan for your family? That's, that's something that, that comes up a lot. Um, a lot of shortfalls in there, the different strategies that we can use. Disability, you're all, you know, 1099 employees. If something happens to you, there's no... Um, I don't know if you get workman's comp or anything like that, but if something were to happen, disability. Uh, this next one, long-term care is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, Craig touched on a little bit. Um, you know, and what happens is as we get older, we start seeing our parents going into to assisted living or nursing homes or, or things like that. And it becomes a bigger issue. And, and I don't know if anybody's looked at long-term care costs and nursing homes and all that, but, but most people are one long-term care event away from financial disaster. And again, we see it. And so we like to let everybody know. 70% of folks over 65 are gonna, gonna have um, a long-term care event where they need some at-home care or assist living or something like that. So something about legacy planning. Do you like your kids? If you like them, maybe you want to leave them something. If not, hell with them. That's what uh, I say. Um, that's, uh, Pretty binary, yes, no, but no. Um, no, but that's a, but let's, you know, you don't want to give your kids or spouse or, you know, your church or whoever the, uh, you know, a burden of a big taxable inheritance. So what am I going to do with it? How do I, how do I figure that out? So, so that's something that you need to consider. What do you want to leave behind and how do you want to uh, maximize that so that your heirs get it and not the government? Okay. All right. Oh, sir. Just a comment on the long-term planning. Yes, sir. Um, I know <coughs> for a lot of people, they have a decision to where with their house, they want to keep their house, right? But now they need to go in the long term, right? And if their policy doesn't cover it, they're, they're torn. Do I get a, a reverse mortgage? Yep. Or, or um, you know, but I want to keep my property. And, I, and a lot of people don't have the option because they didn't get enough long-term care. So they're, somebody else is making the decision for them or sometimes they're having to turn their equity in their house over to whoever's going to take care of them. Yes, sir. Longer their house. Yes, sir. It's all about control. It's right. control. And a lot of people don't, you know, you start talking about long-term care and insurance. People, you know, they don't like talking about it. I get it. It's not insurance. It's asset protection. It's there to protect what you've worked so hard to, to accumulate over the years. That's what people miss. And, and again, no one likes to think about it. No one likes to think about bad things. Taryn? 
Um, yeah, I just had a question. So do you guys help with the consolidation of like 401ks, like pre-existing employee 401ks, and then maybe potentially like putting our assets into like a life insurance policy, coupling that with a Roth RIA, and like doing a consolidated financial planning across that board? Yep, absolutely. We, we do comprehensive financial planning, we, you know, from everything from investments, emergency fund, insurance, um, helping you locate all those 401ks and, you know, herd those cats and dogs and get them together. That's another thing, too. I mean, basically, you know, if you if, if you pass away, and a lot of people, if you've traveled a lot or worked with a lot of different companies, you have all these little pots of money here and there. Or maybe you, you're a do-it-yourselfer, and you've got this mutual fund here and this investment and then this and that, and then you pass, and then everybody's like, where the hell's all the money? Like, I don't, you know, where do we find it? So that's what that's the thing, you know, is as you get older, like let's get one belly button to like like get all the money under one umbrella and not that being one certain thing. There's lots of different products out there. And and yes, that that's that's exactly what we do, Terrence. So good question. Good good question. I appreciate it. Anybody else on any of that? So the only thing I was just gonna say there is you also want to make sure that you set up your beneficiary and co owners of those properly because if not then sometimes people have to go through probate oh, to get access to that account 100 percent. we make sure that when we work with folks that's one thing we check we make sure that your beneficiaries are set up and then we walk you through like let's get the will so that the will and the beneficiaries all line up and you know if, if as long as most people in their family get along um that's usually pretty good but if you have have people you, you know stepkids or ex-wives or things like that that you think are going to come after your money trusts are not a bad idea i mean uh, we can talk about that some other time but um but for the most part most situations that's good enough We're having the will and the beneficiaries all lined up and we, we make sure you did search can you convert 401ks into Roth? yes sir you can absolutely um, and can you take can you take loans out of your Roth? For purchasing a home or in paying yourself back or no? No, I mean it's, your, it's just an investment account. It's a mutual fund. It, you don't really. There's no like leverage to, to borrow money. You can take money out of it. It's also like the contributions that you put in. You can do it. No, so, but when you when you convert the four hundred one k, let's say you convert one hundred thousand to a Roth, right? Is that considered a contribution? Because you're going to have to pay taxes. No, no. It's once it's it, so a four hundred one k is already considered retirement money. It's already in that retirement account. So when you convert it, that's a great point though. When you convert money, it doesn't count against your contribution limits for that year because it's already retirement money. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. This is the same thing for TSP. So I have, I have a TSP account. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you so the the step basically, are you in just traditional TSP or are you have Roth TSP as well? Not traditional. Okay. Yeah. What we do is we we move the money over into a, a traditional IRA. And then we talked to you about kind of what, what Craig was saying about the, the Roth conversion strategies, where you're at on your, on your income. We don't want to get you in another tax bracket. You have a lot of time until you get to that age of having to take required distributions. So we sit down and figure out with you, if you have a CPA, figure out the smart strategies to get, get all that money into a Roth before the RMDs happen. Great question. Sir. So I'm curious about any kind of assurance or guarantee on rates of return at first command. Okay, there's none, <laughs> but that's any investment, right? I mean, there, there are guaranteed vehicles that you can put money into, and First Command doesn't have our own products. We work, we go throughout the industry with different products, with Fidelity, BlackRock, Invesco, Franklin Templeton, um, different, you know, insurance companies, Midland, uh, sorry, Brian, uh, uh, <laughs> Nationwide, uh, Lincoln, things like that. We, we, we because we work primarily with military, we make sure we have the best products available. Now, any investment, there's no, I mean, any anything that's going to be in stocks or things like that, it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to guarantee rate of return. <coughs> there are um, multi-year guaranteed bonds, annuities. With bonds, you have fixed interest. You can do that, right? But, but if you're looking at investing, yeah, you can. we, we have bond funds that are, that are going to be more more stable and all that, things like that, yes. There's different, different avenues, but... Um, you know, obviously any investment vehicle is subject to some sort of risk. So good questions though, sir. Is it true that you could borrow money from a 401k for the down payment on a house, but not from an IRA? Because if you take it out of the IRA, you can't put it back like a loan. Right. 401ks are going to be uh, dependent on the employer, right? That's whatever the provisions are. Generally, yes, you can borrow money for, for that. 
There are provisions for our first term home buyers with, um, with IRAs where you can use $10,000 each. You and your spouse can both do $10,000 from your IRA without penalty to put onto, onto the down payment. That's a great question given the audience that we're sitting in for sure. Right, am I, I saw you nod your head. Am I good on that one? Is there, okay. Good question. Good questions. All Is that right. $10,000 to purchase a house or can I buy a piece of land? Uh, home purchase. First time. Home purchase. Yeah, first yeah. time only. Well, but the but the rule is correct me if I'm wrong. Two years is it's like if you if you haven't bought a house in two years, you can you can use that. You can only use it one time in your life, but you can use it if you've already owned a house. But there's I think it's two three years, years. Okay. three years, three years. Okay. Good, good, good cross that, sir. Uh, how does disability <coughs> insurance work? Um, like for example, um, premiums like. Wanted to get like twelve hundred dollars a month, for example. How 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 does the pricing work and stuff like that? That's a really in depth question. I'd really love to just sit down with you and, and go through that. I don't know if you may have some insights on that. You get, you, from your perspective on on, I've not I've not had a whole lot of experience with it. So, but I would I'd be willing to sit down with you and kind of figure that out. Depends on what you're looking for. Uh, Bruce has a team of individuals who spe uh, specialize just in disability insurance. So is it just a generic disability policy? Is it going to be own occupation, which is a little more uh, focused in on what you do versus being able to, you know, totally disabled, whereas you can't do anything, versus I can't go back to the same job I was doing before. All those things will play a role in how much the ultimate premium is, but there's an underwriting process, and they have a team of specialists that can help you figure out what's the right balance of income protection to premium that you would pay. Great question, so appreciate that. Yes, sir. Have we mentioned that any contribution to an IRA has to be earned income? We have not mentioned that. That is a great, that's a great uh, point. It can't be like residual income from rental properties or things like that, right? Or pensions from, pensions the, pensions from the military. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. That's, that's Social Security. Fantastic point. Yep. If you're, I, I, yes, you, that has to be earned income. I'm assuming that you're all here and you're working. That, that, that's everyone's case, but that's a fantastic point to bring up. Um, yeah, as long as you're working or spouse, if your spouse is working, you can and you you're not, you can also contribute to an IRA. So good good points there. Uh, let me let me roll through it. Then we'll do. I'll, I'll have the other guys come up and we'll do do a um, bigger Q and A. But but here's what some of the reasons that people don't work with financial advisors. I'm sure you hear a lot of this too as as a realtor as um, people go who want to do you know for sale by owners things like that. Oh, I can do it. Yeah. Okay. Sure, you can. But do you want to have put that up with the hassle of doing all the paperwork? I bought houses. I know what a, I. I can't imagine. Like, I don't know how you guys go through all that paperwork. Cause it's such a such a hassle. So, um, you know, that's the thing that you you know you talk to your clients about when they say, "Yeah, I'm just going to sell it myself." Well, you're going to have to learn all that stuff, and and I'm probably going to be able to maximize your return better as a realtor because I know the market. I know you know what all, everything that's going on in the market, right? So. So that's, you know, same thing here. You don't have time to be looking at all these different investment things, um, doing the research, excuse me. You know, that's where we come into play. Um, kind of talk about our, our financial planning process. <coughs> the bottom line, the, good, the, the, the key thing is, excuse me, is that it's complimentary. There's no fees to sit down with an advisor and go through your goals and what your budget is and, and have us put a plan together for you. Um, talking about, you know, Retirement goals, pre-retirement goals, all those things get to know you. Just like you, it, it's it's a relationship-based business. Just like you, yours are. You know, you don't just it's such as not transactional. Sit down and figure out who you are and put a plan together. It's all complimentary. If you like it, great. If you don't, we can still be friends. We can still exchange Christmas cards. So I just buzzed through that. Sorry. Okay. So. Um, Great questions. I want to call, I want to ask Brian and Craig to come up, and, and uh, if you have any other questions about anything we talked about, um, which is, uh, hopefully between the three of us, we can answer it, ma'am. Um, aside from the five twenty nine, what are other ways we can? I mean, I have a six year old and a four year old. What can we be doing to set them up? Because I'm a realtor, my husband's getting his real estate license as well, so we won't have the standard four hundred one k or any of that for us, let alone. Okay. And you guys want to take that, take that one? So saving, is it for saving for college or you're just trying to save for your kids? Just, I mean, 
I don't know that they will go to college. I don't. By the time they're old enough, who knows what they'll choose to do. Yeah. I, got a, I got a college degree. I don't use it. So. <laughs> you know, I feel the same way. I got a college degree. I did nothing with it. So I had that exact same conversation with my dad. He's like, why aren't you doing 529s? Why aren't you doing 529s? And I said, if you want to do it as grandpa, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. So grandpa opened a 529 for both my kids. Um, but we do some other things, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, I, you could do like a uh, just a custodial brokerage account. So like for my kids... I was taking birthday money, money from grandma and grandpa and everything else I was putting into uh, brokerage accounts. And then what ended up happening is once my son got a job, I opened up a Roth IRA, a custodial Roth IRA, and I just started putting that money into a Roth IRA to get him a jump start on potentially saving for retirement. <coughs> and I threatened him with a lot of, you know, all the penalties that he'll have to pay if he takes the money out early, just so that it teaches him the value of saving, earning, and planning for retirement. So that's that's one of the basic things you look at is just start saving some birthday money in a brokerage account, and then once they get a job, transfer it to like a Roth IRA. The other idea I'll share is something that I do with my kids is uh, we put 250 bucks a month for, I have a 10 and an 8-year-old, um, so they can't do a Roth yet or anything like that, they're not working. Uh, we do it into actually what's called max funded life insurance. And so when you typically think of life insurance, you think about it being utilized as, hey, if they die, it's a death benefit. Uh, but life insurance tax laws, actually since 1984, the year I was born, say that the money inside, cash value inside of a life insurance policy grows tax deferred, and it comes out income tax free. So in a lot of ways, it works like a Roth, and you don't have to have earned income to uh, put money towards that. Um, you don't have to wait till 59 and a half to access the money. It's not reportable on a FAFSA if you're trying to qualify for any kind of student loans or uh, any kind of scholarships. Um, and so that's a way for us to invest in our kids and how they ultimately utilize it. It could be to pay for college. It could be for retirement. It could be as a legacy plan. There's a lot of different ways it can be utilized, all tax-free. So that's another way to do it. A lot of questions. Uh, I think I sold that in first. What was the name of that again? It's, we call it max funded life insurance. Uh, it's a concept, okay? So you use permanent insurance. There are different types of permanent insurance. Uh, and depending on what the ultimate goal is, there you could use different types that, you know, Bruce has all these capabilities available to him. Um, but the idea, the concept is called max funded life insurance. You might also hear 7702 plans or LIRPs, um, L-I-R-P. Any of that kind of wording is just fancy ways to say, we're using life insurance for the tax efficiency of cash value. Uh, any, anybody, go ahead. Well, one other thing, too, is that um, you never know when someone's going to have a pre existing condition that's going to keep them from getting life insurance in the future. Yeah. So, at least by you getting that for them young, if they do have something later along, at least they have some life insurance because there are some people that once they have an issue, they're and not. And I went through that in my own family, so I'm an identical twin. Uh, you would never know it in a lot of different ways. One, he's somehow three inches taller than me, even though we're identical. I got screwed there. He's smarter than me. Uh, he was a college athlete, so he's a better athlete than me. Long story short, in every way, this guy, is, my twin brother, has been better than me his whole life and was a great college athlete track. One day off for a run, six-mile run at 33 years old, falls over, thinks he's having a heart attack. He has myocarditis, led to an autoimmune disorder. Now he's completely uninsurable. He's gained over 100 pounds. At 33 years old, life completely went from being D1 athlete to completely uninsurable for the rest of his life. So life can happen, and, and the insurability aspect is good, too. There's a question in the back. Yeah, so can you kind of, I guess, a brief summary on the difference between, like, a universal life insurance and the ones you just talked about, like the 70, 30, or the large? Yeah, great question. So universal life, uh, there's four main flavors of permanent insurance. There's whole life, Okay. Um, and there's different flavors of whole life, okay? Uh, whole life is a more conservative type investment. Your returns are going to more mirror that of a bank of account right now. So like maybe anywhere from 4 to 6% returns on the cash values inside of it. So it's better for short-term cash value needs. Uh, then you have three flavors of universal life. There's guaranteed universal life. We do not use it at all for this kind of funding because it's really meant to be a death benefit play. It has no cash value in it. Um, the two that we utilize for the ideas I mentioned are what's called indexed universal life, um, which has market-like returns, but it brackets your returns between zero and what is known as a cap. Okay, so typically around 9 to 10% is the maximum you can earn. And then there's variable universal life where they actually send your money to investment companies like Fidelity, Invesco, the companies Bruce was naming earlier, and they manage your money, which means the money can go down if those investments do poorly, but the money has 
unlimited upside depending on how you invest. So all kinds of different ways to utilize that strategy. For my kids, by the way, I did, I did variable universal life. Okay. They're young. Yeah. There's time horizon. It's probably going to be at least 20 years before they use it. I like the markets. For someone with a shorter time frame, I would look at a more conservative type pulse. And so like the difference between your children and maybe yourself and structuring like generational wealth, would you consider an index for yourself, but then like the... The Great question. Uh, for generational wealth, I still like variable universal life because it's still a longer time frame. Now, keep in mind, this is why you meet with someone like Bruce because your risk tolerance and things like that will play a role. I'm an extremely aggressive investor. I believe in the markets. Um, 40 out of the last 50 years, the S&P has been up. I'm a big fan of it. So I would say I still like the UO there, but it depends on the person. And that's why you have those conversations. I'm going to ask her. She uh, raised her hand a couple times. And then we'll um, I was going to say, so when you have a life insurance, whatever those options are, so whoever opens, like in my case, if I want to open for my son or whatever, so that tax benefit of having the life insurance is for me, right? It's under my name, not for the beneficiary. But so right now, I own my children's policies because they're minors, but eventually I will transfer ownership to them, and then I'll take advantage of annual gifting laws that allow me to gift money to my kids without reporting it on taxable income. You can gift up to 18000 to anybody you want uh, every year. So when they come of age, I'll actually gift them the policies. They'll now own them because they're considered adults. I might not do it at 18. I might wait till they're a little more responsible. <laughs> Um, but at some point, they'll own those policies. I can still be the payer of those policies, but I would gift the premiums. And you don't have to, to pay taxes on it. No, never a taxable transaction ever. Yep. Can you all speak to the fact um, of let's say there's a lawsuit and let's say there's a judgment, but a person owns some of these um, vehicles, how some of those are protected against even a lawsuit judgment? Yeah. So, so some of the advantage of the variable, it can still grow. And even if a lawsuit was against that person, that life policy is protected. So yeah, so on the insurance front, because there's there's yeah. creditor protections for yeah. different types of investments. Yeah. On the insurance front, it, it is actually state specific. Um, but for instance, I'm from Texas. I flew in this morning from Dallas, as Bruce mentioned. Uh, Texas, all life insurance proceeds, for, so death benefits and cash values are wholly protected from creditors. Right. Um, so for business owners who potentially have liability, first of all, you should be looking at liability insurance for yourselves, okay? Um, but second of all, uh, a lot of insurance does offer a lot of creditor protections in that regard. That makes those assets uh, not only income tax-free, but creditor protected as well. So that, that's what we're going to look at is, you know, number one is, you know, this is we're talking to real, so when you're, someone's purchasing a house, make sure you talk to your client, to your clients about an umbrella policy. So I live in Arizona. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, if you all watch golf, I'm three miles away from where uh, TPC Scottsdale is. So in the wintertime, and then Barrett Jackson's over there as well. So January, February, and especially if we have the Super Bowl there, uh, I very quickly find myself, let, you know, in front of me, behind me, and either side of me, where each one of those cars probably is more than the value of my house. So I don't want to just go left, right, up, or down, or anything else, or hit, hit any of those cars. That's why I get an umbrella policy over my house to provide me that additional protection other than I get from my homeowner's insurance and my automobile insurance. That umbrella policy gives me additional protection on there. Then you have to look at is, you know, what's the liability? So if you're dealing with your clients that may have multiple properties, Shouldn't have to tell you guys, but that's where the benefits of having an LLC, uh, setting them all up in an LLC. Um, one of the things that came down last decade from the Supreme Court, so my mother has, you know, a million dollars in her IRA. She passes away, 500000 goes to my brother, $500,000 goes to me. Well, what the Supreme Court said is that IRA is not going to receive the same kind of creditor protections because it's an inherited IRA compared to a 401k or an IRA. So again, that's where having trust, having, setting up a trust comes into play as well. So that way, not only it shields your assets from probate, but it also helps protect your assets from additional, uh, additional lawsuits and liabilities. Does that help answer your question? No, 
Most people don't learn those things till after the fact. So. Yeah. Do, you want, do you want to be a financial advisor, sir? No, I got scarves and t-shirts. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions up there? Fantastic questions. We really appreciate it. I see people getting restless. Let me wrap up real quick. If, if you wouldn't mind, the, the, the feedback form, we always like to know what we're doing good, what we can improve on. Uh, fill out. I'm going to also, if you um, if you fill one out, we're going to do drawings for top golf outings um, and to do that. <laughs> um, and if you'd like to sit down with somebody, drop me or Bethany, uh, one of your business cards, we'll reach out. Again, no cost, no obligation, no pressure. Sit down, talk about your goals, see if we can help you. And, um, you know, to, uh, to get you get your uh, get your play on track, just take action. That's that's the key. Get it get it moving forward. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. We I really appreciate it. Great questions, great crowd, um, and, um, and we'll be seeing you around at different events in the, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I always start out with, yes, so if you're looking for when to start claiming your social security, what's the retirement age, 67, you said? All of them. I didn't hear that either. So the basic good news is that you start out with the retirement age, but you've already passed it. Yeah. Much more flexible. Just about me. You have an idea.